Uh, but welcome to this Marks and Meeting of Social Security, Can We Undo the Damage of Welfare Reform? Uh, my name is Pat Clinton. I'm a member of uh, the SWP in Manchester and I'll be chairing today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, speakers here, they'll have about 10 minutes apiece and then we will have time for contributions, questions from the floor and all of that. So first I'd like to welcome uh, Paula Peters who's an, on the uh, National Steering Group of Sale People Against the Cuts and Chair of Bromley and Croy in the United Community. So, thank you. Well, thank you to everyone at Marxism for the invitation to um, speak to you all today. And um, hey, look who's just walked into the building. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you, Debbie. Right, let us... I'm going to be really blunt and I think try and be to the point. You know, from overwhelming evidence submitted by us at DPAC, Black Triangle, Mental Health Resistance Network, other campaigners, groups, academics, families and disabled people themselves, there is overwhelming theme running through welfare reform as we know. And that is, and, and it is today and was, an ideological political choice that these reforms were designed to cause maximum distress, harm and poverty. And with the welfare reforms, cuts to social care and cuts to services and horrendous impact on disabled people's lives have resulted in the UK being investigated by the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of People with Disabilities with overwhelming evidence submitted to the committee they ruled that the government was guilty of grave and systemic human rights violations towards disabled people. And I want to pay tribute to my fellow brothers and sisters at DPAC that were instrumental in bringing about that complaint. <laughs> and to everybody else who's tireless work and, you know, writing evidence, it's no mean feat, believe me. And then in 2017, with even further evidence, of the impact of welfare reform, cuts to social care, the committee ruled that the cat cuts were a human catastrophe on disabled people's lives. Let's be honest, there is a lot wrong at the Department of Work and Pensions that they still callously deny the impact of welfare reforms on people's lives, that disabled people have taken their own lives after being found fit for work after a work capability assessment, and we must continue to call for an independent inquiry into what has been going on at the DWP all the way through welfare reforms of the last nine years. And we need people to sign that Parliament petition calling for justice for Jodie Whiting, an independent inquiry into benefit deaths linked to the DWP. It's only at 50,000 signatures. Disabled people are dying. Can sign a Brexit petition of over 3 million. 50,000 people, 50,000 signatures for disabled people dying. Please sign that petition and share it everywhere you can over the next few weeks. And we do not want revenge, we want justice. We want, we want to see Ian Duncan Smith, Esther McVeigh, Amber Rudd and all the government in the dock facing justice for benefit deaths and human rights violations towards disabled people. And this is a message to Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt. Believe me, know our names because we're coming for you. And we're not going to let you, we're not going to let you stay in number 10 because our mission is to get the Tories out and we need your help to do that. But we need to continue the campaign to challenge the horrendous government rhetoric of worker versus claimant that's caused so much division over nine years of welfare reforms, ramped up the hostile environment and caused so much damage to campaigns. People need to stop feeding into this rhetoric. We need to put differences aside and work together against the damage we are seeing to our welfare state. Work together for the future of our social security system. We ask the DWP PCS Working Group to support our demos and our campaigns, meet with us and talk to us. That where job centres have high sanction rates and are not unionised sufficiently to support local reps and regional officer, officers to build membership of the PCS union. 
But it needs to be stressed that over 42% of the DWP staff themselves will be subjected to universal credit. They'll be sanctioning one another before very long. And that's not, that's not, that is not fun, that is pretty, um, quite scary. And for people to remember that it is government that makes policy, ministers and top civil servants, not the frontline staff, and that areas put frontline staff under tremendous pressure to meet targets. You know, Ian Duncan Smith pressed ahead with the design of Universal Credit, a system that had huge computer design flaws running into millions of pounds of overspend, a system that was delayed again and again, a system that had punitive punishment at its heart. Universal Credit is fundamentally flawed at every level, and overwhelming evidence has shown the long payment delays, high sanction rates, rocketing homelessness and poverty, women driven into prostitution, and staying in abusive relationships. And it is an indictment on the Tories that universal credit is such a disaster. We knew at DPAC that universal credit could not be paused and fixed, as many were saying. And we began the campaign calling for it to be stopped and scrapped. And you can get our stickers and badges at our stall uh, downstairs. And we've had a lot of success with the motions that we've written, with Unite the Union changing their position from pause and fix to stop and scrap last year, National Union of Students, many CLPs, the RMT and the Disabled Workers Committee to name a few. But it's deep, with deep disappointment that we note that the Labour position has not moved to support our position, despite overwhelming evidence showing what is wrong with universal credit. And it is of vital importance that we, as campaigners and trade unionists, continue to hold Labour's feet to the fire and pile pressure on them to change their position as part of their ongoing welfare policy. And I'd like to pay tribute to all campaigners and trade unionists campaigning against universal credit and welfare reforms and how their example of how disabled campaigners are not waiting for Jeremy Corbyn to come in and fix everything. We are seeing the great campaign in Norfolk against universal credit. Unite Community have had local and uh, national days of action and are currently asking people to fill out their Universal Credit Survey to submit to MPs. They've also got a day of action on um, the 1st of August to so please support local actions and the action at Side Caxton House. The library campaigns, which are an integral part of UC campaigning, and a big shout out to my fellow Bromley Unite workers right now who are on indefinite strike action. There's a donation bucket down there, please, whatever you can, donate what you can, because their strike funds are low. Without the strike funds, they can't continue to campaign. And I also want to pay um, tribute to, um, you know, my brothers and sisters, like I said, Bromley Unite. Um, we've supported the campaign since 2016. To Sheffield Deepak, who've been doing amazing work on the Dump Metro DWP lies for the last seven weeks. And I've been asking people across the country to go to local train station and um, dump the metros. Make cat, if you've got a cat, get the cat to pee on the, li uh, on the metro for the cat litter trays, right? And um, support the campaign over the next few weeks. Our allies at MHRN and our sister Denise McKenna, who's sitting bashfully over there in the corner, um, we've done amazing work exposing Mind Charity's involvement in their collusion with the DWP on the Health and Work Programme. I act therapy and they're doing amazing work on highlighting the horrendous work is a health outcome policy with the working of the DWP and NHS and ramping up the hostile environment of people in mental distress. And I ask you to join MHRN on the 14th of August for their picnic is a health outcome in Hyde Park. Find out more about MHRN and how you can get involved with them. So this leads on to what the future is for our social security system. Labour and John McDonnell want to introduce universal basic income. Deepak's position on UBI can be found in this uh, book here in front of us and uh, on our website. Now, many say of UBI that it would not replace the existing benefit system. And if a country is paying for UBI for everyone, it's going to cost a lot of extra money to pay for that and reverse all the cuts. We're worried it will put even more pressure on cutting benefits. Why not put the extra money into building the existing social security system and make it fit for purpose? And it's really important that everyone adds their voice and view to the current social security commission that Ellen's helping to chair. 
to voice your say about what kind of social security system we want and how we go about achieving that. And you've the, to the end of July to do that. And I will end with this. It's only by working together, building our movement, united in our aim to get the Tories out and bring about the change we really need and want to see. That is why we must continue to campaign, fight for social justice, equality, inclusion, and that must never stop. Thank you all so much for having me speak to you today. Solidarity on behalf of disabled people against cuts. Uh, next we have uh, Debbie, uh, sorry, Debbie Abrahams, uh, thank you for uh, finding the building. <laughs> um, she's the MP for Oldham East and Saddleworth, Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Health in All Policies and a consistent campaigner against the injustices of welfare and war. So thank you. You can hear me. I don't know, is it, is it alright if I stand up there? Is that okay? And then you can all see me, because I'm only Diddy. And, uh, and it means that I can, can you all still hear me with this? It means that I can spread this out a bit, a bit more. First of all, apologies for, for, being slightly, uh, for being slightly late. I blame it on my daughter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was absolutely delighted to, um, to get the invitation to come uh, talk to you um, today. Um, for me, so much of what Paula has said, I mean, it really just hits home. I don't know if anybody has been following some of the stuff that's been going on in Parliament this week, but uh, I finally got the response to my question, or my letter rather, asking about uh, deaths after being found fit for work um, and also having had a PIP um, application either re um, refused or reduced. Uh, and I also, uh, you know, queried um, a, a around the uh, loss of uh, documents uh, or the lack of access of, docu of documents around the work capability assessment independent review. Apparently, um, Paul Litchfield and um, uh, David Harrington, the reviewers, didn't actually get those uh, the documents about from the coroner's reports or the independent review process they do when uh, anyone dies. And the, if anybody saw in Parliament the response to this by the Minister, it was absolutely shocking. So we've known for a long while in terms of, you know, that the, the social security system just is not fit for purpose. And worse than that, instead of, as all governments should do, their first duty is protect and ensure people are safe. It's, as far as sick and disabled people has gone, it is absolutely the opposite of that. So when I was asked to, to, to sort of chat about um, what, what I've been doing about this, because I, I, so, I'm so passionate about this, I think a fundamental question um, in terms of underpinning what we think about the future of our social security system is what kind of society do we want? That is absolutely fundamental. So we have a country at the moment um, where one in four of our, our children are growing up in, in poverty, one in five in persistent poverty, and this is the fifth richest country in the world. We also have the worst childhood mortality rate in Western Europe. And, you know, is this the kind of country we want to, 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 to live in? I would, I would say no. You know, on top of that, as you will know, you know, we have sick and disabled people being isolated and excluded from society. Over, 400, over uh, 4 million, rather, who are living in poverty exactly because of the lack of support that they get. And we know that in terms of the increases in inequality, uh, not just in income and wealth, but also in power. And again, is this what we want? The average income of the poorest fifth of the population actually reduced uh, by nearly 2%, whereas the fifth richest increased by nearly 5%. The richest 1,000 people in the UK have wealth estimated at 724 billion, compared with the wealth of the poorest 40% at 567 billion. So 1,000 against 40% of the population. You can see the real inequities that, that, that we uh, live in. And the consequences of this are, we're seeing a flatlining life expectancy. For women, it's actually getting worse. Um, and this is in the context of 1950s women having had their state pension aid 
push, uh, pushed up. And it's not just life expectancy, it's how long we can expect to live in good health as well. And for the first time in 100 years, and I think this is particularly shocking, we are seeing infant mortalities, our babies, babies under a year, that's actually gone up the first time in 100 years. Uh, four babies in a thousand will not see their first birthday. And again, this is, do we want this type of society? Is this how we want to live? And I think I could ask each and every one of you, and you'd say, no, this is not acceptable. But I think we also need to recognize that if we are going to, first of all, we need to win a general election to change policy. But if that doesn't happen, what do we need to do? And on both counts, we need to extend beyond everybody here the point that Paul was making in, in terms of the survey around uh, Jodie Whiting, 50,000. We need to reach out to, uh, to more people to make sure that we get them on board as, as, as well. But the good news is that I think more people are coming around to what, uh, to, to what we're saying. I, I, I won't be long, I promise. Um, so the British Social Attitudes Survey has, has shown that people are now saying that this is unacceptable, that it's not, you know, it's not appropriate, that and more than half of them are saying that, that in terms of the cutting Social Security damages people, li people's lives. Seven out of ten people thought that the national living wage should be increased, and nearly eight out of ten thought employers should ensure that they pay enough for anyone in full-time work to, to, to meet a basic cost of living. But they also believe that the government must top up wages where that doesn't uh, happen, particularly for uh, where this doesn't happen. And then you may have come across the minimum income standard. That's published every, every year. It's not about poverty. It's about how, how a panel of ordinary people think what we need to live on, how, how much that is. So it goes beyond um, looking at definitions of poverty. It's how much can we have full, healthy, independent lives um, and it now ranges between 314 pounds per week for a single person and 789 pounds per week for a family of two including two pre-age uh, uh, preschool age children so we can quite we can see that what we have in terms of the national living wage and though that's the increase it hasn't been in enough i'm working up to my argument here that because the jrf who commissioned the mis saying if we just uprate and restore these working age benefits, which have really been slashed, um, that will be okay. But I believe that we need to go much further than that. I wholeheartedly agree we need to address the unfair tax burden and poverty pay through progressive economic policy changes and an industrial strategy that helps create the new high skill, high quality jobs of the future. I believe we need to, but I need to, we need to radically transform our social security system as well. We cannot expect people who are currently living in such hardship, in such poverty, to wait a few years for Labour's real living wage to kick in. And that doesn't even, I'm afraid, it doesn't even encompass what we need to do for sick and disabled people. And again, this is all in the context of Brexit, which is another conversation which I, I, I won't go into. But we, if we look at some of the drivers of Brexit and the result there, and look at how it relates and the evidence around poverty and equality and, and, and how that could have influenced that, I, I, I don't think we should ignore it. So back in 1942, we had the Beveridge Report, and that was the basis for a new welfare state after the Second World War. And that was when the debt that we had after the Second World War stood at 250%. It's now about 90% of, of, of GDP. We established the NHS, we expanded our education system, we undertook a massive housing building program, extended our social security system. And it was heralded as a revolutionary system that would provide income security for all its citizens. But since then, poverty, uh, society has changed. The pressures from globalization, automation, and an aging society means that we need a new sustainable social security system. We should be encouraged by the, by the British Social Attitudes sur uh, Survey saying that the public are already ready for a new public settlement. 
I believe we need a new Burbage report for the 21st century, defining a new social contract with the British people, addressing the poverty, inequalities and indignity millions of people are enduring. We need to bring hope to a new generation, as we did 77 years ago. Can I have a couple of minutes? Like, do I have a couple of minutes? Not really, yeah. to be honest. It's, 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 it's quite tight. I can, a, couple, a couple of minutes and just tell you what I think we, we, we should do. Well, first of all, we need to develop of the consensus that, oh, uh, that Ellen's doing through her commission. We need to get out and make sure that not just people who uh, took part in the BSA survey, but the country as a whole is up for this. I think we need to ensure um, that our system, you know, we have a consensus about what, it, what its purpose is, but also in terms of its principles and its ethos. It should be evidence-based, but that evidence needs to be driven by all of us. Nothing about us without us. And our, our social security system has tended to ape our neo, neoliberal cousins over in the US. We need to understand and learn from our Nordic uh, neighbours and elsewhere as, as well. If you have a look at uh, Beveridge, there are some quite profound principles around universalism, about a contributory uh, approach um, and others. But I again would like to extend this about making sure that it is around, around reducing inequality. It is about providing that dignity, ensuring that we have a culture within our system that supports and, not, uh, and doesn't demonise. So I think we can pay for it. I've got a, a lot in terms of how it could be paid for uh, in this, but I know I've gone over my time and I thank the chair for being so tolerant with me and I, I hope to write this up and uh, you can read about it later. Thanks everyone. And um, our next speaker is Mark Swapka, who's a General Secretary of the uh, Public and Communication Services Union, PCS, the largest trade union representing uh, British civil servants. Well, thanks very, very much. Thanks very much also for the uh, invitation. And can I say I'm delighted to be speaking with, uh, with Paula, Ellen and Debbie, all of whom have done fantastic work on the question of social security, disabled people, and fighting against government cuts. Uh, I represent the, the workers who work in DWP, and so I want to address my comments to um, not just what's needed in terms of a new social security system, reflecting how we got to where we got, but actually look at what the answer is. And particularly the role played by PCS members in DWP, what more we can do, and why I entirely agree with Paula, we're not the problem here. Uh, our members uh, are disciplined. If they don't sanction enough people, we have members sacked who've had eight days sickness in one year, and we have 42% of those members who claim the benefits that they administer. And Paul is actually right under universal credit, sanctions will soon be applied to in-work benefits, which does mean public sector workers will be asked to sanction other public sector workers. So we're in a real mess. But the title of this uh, session was Can We Undo the Damage of Welfare Reform? So I want to start by saying yes. Um, but only if certain things are done. And my starting point has to be, therefore, that we all have to be very clear, we won't, undamage the, we won't undo the damage done by tinkering, by changing little bits or pieces. We need a complete rewrite and a complete redrafting of the social security system. And that, um, that requires going back to the principles of beverage and the radical post-war Labour government which was a system that delivered for everyone from cradle to grave to ensure that people were able not just to manage at subsistence levels, but to be treated in a proper way until they found uh, better times. And if those better times are never going to come, that they get the adequate support throughout their lifetime. So PCS has launched a policy, and uh, I would urge people to get our pamphlet uh, and to join the debates that we have started, not just at Labour Party meetings, but publicly, the calls for a radical reform of Social Security. And why I think people need to read it is we have to understand how we got to where we got and not just think all of this started with the coalition government and Theresa May, actually trace it right back to Margaret Thatcher in 1979 and right through the new Labour government that actually delivered all sorts of terrible cuts and 
And the reason that I start there, and it's often unpopular with, with some of my friends in the Labour Party, is because if we don't understand the political consensus that formed around attacking our welfare state, which, by the way, we call a social security system, not welfare, it's a very important difference, we won't understand the solutions. And if you go back, I started work in the DHSS in Aberdeer in 1980. So that was a mining town with eight mines in that valley alone. Lots of poverty. Where people worked, it was usually down the pit or in the public sector. My first day at work, I was told by my supervisor, and it's an important point to make, whatever you do when you're here, Mark, in the eight hours you're here, every minute you spend here, you should be looking at how you can help the people who come through these doors. Now you fast forward to 2019 and our members in job centres are told this new thing. The big buzzword is reduce footfall. It is not about helping people, it is pushing them out of the door. It is directing them to inhumane contact centres. It is about seeing there's no continuity of service. And it is a system that has turned the job that we did from support and helping people to access the benefits that they should get to one where routinely we are now seen as the enemy. And I understand entirely, if you turn up three minutes late for an interview and you are sanctioned, you will see the enemy as the person who has delivered that sanction. What we have to understand is if that person doesn't deliver that sanction, they themselves can be disciplined and lose their job. So this is a vicious circle of an oppressive state regime that oppresses the workers in the system and that in turn oppresses the people who rely on our welfare state. And if we are divided amongst ourselves, what it means is that they keep getting away with it, which is why I've always been proud to work with Paula and Ellen. I've always been prepared to listen to the stories they tell me where we know we have some members who are more zealous than you would want them to be, but that overwhelmingly the people I represent are themselves demoralized and often depressed about what they have to do when they walk through the job center door. So if we trace back to 1979, I can tell you when I started, you could claim benefits at 16, students could claim benefit in term time, you were able to have grants instead of loans, and you didn't have a system where currently the state pays the Citizens Advice Bureau to take out contracts to help people fill the forms in when it used to be that is the job of our members. And I routinely would spend an hour and a half with pensioners in Aberdeer and then in Rotherham and Sheffield where I worked, helping them navigate through the system. It's why we believe in universality, not means testing, because a simple truism, universal benefits like child benefit get to 98% of those who should get to it. When you have pensioner credit that is means tested, it gets to only just over 67%. <coughs> so what we need is to recognize the attacks have been huge, starting with Thatcher, the Norman Fowler reviews, but then tragically when New Labour came to power with a huge mandate, the wasted opportunity that was to be a radical reforming government was one that adopted much of the neoliberal agenda and nowhere was that truer than its attitude to trade unions, its attitude to the free market and privatisation and its attitude to social security, which meant that the first whip vote under the new regime asked Labour MPs, elected being told the country things could only get better, to vote for cuts in benefits to single parents. And it is to their credit that the now leaders of the Labour Party refused to be whipped to vote against those cuts in going back, way back to Tony Blair's years and recently against changes to the welfare state in recent years. But I want to tell you what all of this has done. What it's done is giving us a struggle that we have to recognise is an uphill struggle. In 1983, polls showed us that over two-thirds of the public believe more money should be spent on Social Security. Last year, a similar poll said less than a third of people thought that money should be invested in Social Security. Why? Because they've been subjected to a 30-year propaganda battle about skivers and shirkers and benefit claimants. And in our pamphlet, what we describe is we now routinely get benefit porn on the TV served up as entertainment with can't pay, won't pay benefit streets and where we get the middle classes entertained by the poverty and despair that are felt not just by disabled people and single parents, but those who are poor. And it has whipped up this idea that allows the government to get away with employing 5,000 PCS members in DWP on benefit fraud, while it employs less than 500 PCS members on tax avoidance and evasion in HMRC. The difference is benefit fraud is usually pennies and pounds and is people feeding and heating their houses. Tax fraud is usually tens of millions of pounds and is committed by the rich. It tells us all we need to know about austerity, 
that is a neoliberal project making those without pay the biggest price for the follies of those at the top. And it is brought about not just by neoliberal politics, but dividing people to think that public sector workers are somehow getting it easy against private sector workers, that those in work are easier off than those people who are scrounging, and those people born in this country are somehow more worthy than those who came here. It is classic divide and rule, and on benefits and social security, it is where you see it at its worst. So I'm going to turn to a conclusion by saying this. We have to understand the problem. We have to understand the political census, consensus has brought us to where we are, and we need to understand the divisions that it has caused in order to reach the solution. And my solutions are simple. We need a complete rewrite. There's a debate to be had about universal basic income. Our union says the jury is out. There is a progressive case can be made for universal basic income, but it is also supported by reactionary right-wingers who see that it is a project designed to take the role of the state away from offering any support at all. And it's clearly not something that is coming anytime soon. So in the here and now, and I'm happy to add to Paula's list, PCS policy is now to scrap universal credit. It is no longer... <laughs> We've listened to the people that we campaign with and we've listened to the experiences of our members. So we say we can debate UBI, but when a new Labour government takes office, some things have to happen immediately. There has to be a tax hike for those who can afford it to pay for a social security system that has no capability tests for the disabled, no sanctions whatsoever, and no conditionality rules that are applied by ensuring that they are so strict that the whole focus comes on saying how you do not pay people what they should get, rather than giving the people the support you want. It is why we have concluded, almost certainly, the DWP should be split back into the old component parts that says a social security department should be separate from a department of employment, because one should be about ensuring people get what they need to manage, the other should be about helping people into work. If you link the two, conditionality becomes an almost inevitable consequence. And so I'll finish by saying this. If you need a radical change in social security system based on the founding principles of cradle to grave for disabled people, single parents, and let's chuck it in there on pensions. Let's have a pension age of 60 reducing to 55 and a four day working week, <laughs> not a pension age of 50. And what we need is a radical government. So we do need a Corbyn government as soon as possible to introduce these policies. We need radical action in the meantime and afterwards, supporting all demonstrations and direct action and uniting the claimants with those inside who face their own, although very different, forms of oppression. And finally, we need strong unions. And I'll leave it on this point. When the welfare state was at its strongest, trade unions were at its strongest. The 1970s, the years we're told when this country was going to the dogs was when this country was at its most equal, when we had the most militant, largest trade unions that we had seen. We are now half as strong with the most restrictive anti-union laws in the world. Strong unions enable unions like ours not just to grow, but to take the type of action, this is my last line, that when I was a rep in 1983 and the fraud squad came to my office, I issued a press release to the Aberdare leader, really, really frontline paper in the South Wales Valleys, <laughs> and the headline was, Union warns that fraud squad descend on the Aberdare Valley. And I still carried on working. Today, if any of our people did that, they would be sacked instantly. So strong unions allied to radical campaigners and radical solutions is how we change it, no tinkering, and that's why I take my hat off, not just the organisers of this meeting, but again, particularly to Paula and Ellen, who have led from the front and done such inspirational work. Thanks very much. And uh, we now have our last speaker, who is um, Ellen Clifford, who is a member of South East London SWP and also from the National Steering Group uh, DPAC. So, thank you. When the Tories came to power in 2010, they set about driving a sledgehammer through the welfare state while calling it reform. They weren't looking to get rid of it altogether, but they were intent on reshaping it through privatisation, trying to push on us an insurance-based model 
and making huge cuts by tightening eligibility criteria and removing entitlements wherever possible, regardless of the lives and the futures they ruined in the process. What we've experienced is the biggest shake-up shake -up of the welfare state since its inception. The human cost of what the Tories have done has been extreme, and on such a scale that the United Nations found evidence of grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights due to welfare reform. Poverty, inequality and insecurity have impacted negatively on the mental and physical health of millions of people in Britain, as death and distress have become an everyday part of our benefit system. The damage inflicted on our society will take generations to recover from. But before we can even begin the process of recovery, we have to start by stopping the damage from being taken yet further. Last year, Theresa May announced that austerity is over. <laughs> it was a sign of how much pressure the Tories were under, but it didn't mean that the pain of the cuts was going to stop any time soon. And in terms of welfare reform, the, the Tories have just continued pushing on in exactly the same direction with nothing more than minor concessions. It's true we haven't let the Tories have it all their own way since 2010. Socialists, campaigners such as Deepak, trade unions, allies within the Labour Party such as Debbie, have battled every step of the way and are still fighting. But as weak and divided as the Tories are at the moment, they're still hammering through disastrous policies like the rollout of Universal Credit, or UC. We're not even halfway through the rollout of UC yet, with millions more people set to be affected. Everywhere it goes, there's rising poverty, fee bank use and misery. The DPAC research team released a report last month collating 90 pages worth of links to hundreds of stories and reports detailing impacts such as homelessness, debt, people turning to sex work and survival crime to get by. And all of this was collected over a period of just 16 weeks from January to May this year. The United Nations Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty commented after his visit to the UK last year that preparations by local authorities ahead of UC rollout in their areas reminded him of scenes he'd witnessed elsewhere in the world where governments were preparing for impending natural disasters. The difference with UC is that this disaster is not only man-made but also entirely preventable. It could and should have been stopped by now. The Tories refused to consider automatic transition despite having been warned that 750,000 disabled people could fall through the now sizeable gaps in the system and end up left penniless through not having adequate support to navigate the UC application process. UC is rotten to its core, as Paul has described. No comprehensive planning was ever done to prepare for UC rollout. The project management approach is called something, is, is called test and learn, okay? which is something that's only suitable for smaller projects, not ones affecting the lives of millions of people and involving essential income that families rely on to survive. As the UN Poverty Rapporteur described it, test and learn effectively uses the most disadvantaged members of society as guinea pigs. The amount of money and time wasted on UC is such at, which is such a shambolic programme. That is a terrible indictment of the Tories' incompetence, but also of their cruelty. Action is needed now to stop further damage being caused by welfare reform. And that does mean that we can't sit and wait for a Corbyn government. And Labour's position on universal credit has fallen short of the stop and scrap position that we need. We need to be uniting now to force the government to stop universal credit. We need to demand it scrapped and urgently replaced with something that's fit for purpose. It can be difficult to keep going when struggle is at a low level. So we need to take heart from examples where campaigning is making a difference, as Paula touched on in her speech. Campaigning by DPAC last year pushed Unite the Union, the TUC Disabled Workers Conference, and then the TUC itself to adopt a position of stop and scrap. Campaigning against universal credit by Sheffield DPAC led to them receiving a leaked internal DWP email that tipped us off about universal credit advertorials in the Metro newspaper that were set to run over a number of weeks. The email said they were deliberately designed to look like journalistic coverage, so that it would be unclear that it came from the DWP, while presenting a glossy and misleading and totally unrepresentative picture of the realities of UC. So in response, Deepak started our Dump Metro DWP Lies campaign, which has been a great example of what we can achieve when we collectivise our resistance and when we unite. 
Social media showed people getting a real buzz from taking part in whatever way they could. There were bus drivers clearing their buses of the metro, station staff helping activists to smuggle papers away before the commuters turned up, mobility scooters crammed full of copies leaving the metro stands empty. People who couldn't get out to help donated money online to hire transport so that we could take the papers en masse from the stations straight to recycling or they circulated coverage online to promote the campaign and trade unions passed motions in support. At Sheffield Station last week it seemed the armed police had been called in to guard the metro stands <laughs> to make sure people took one at a time. And this week, this week there were no ads. Although the leaked email had given us to expect it would be a nine week run. So this is the kind of active working class resistance we need to stop further destruction by the Tories and then to reverse the damage that's already been done. <laughs> Getting a Corbyn-led government is a step in the right direction and something we all need to fight for. But the fight won't stop there. We'll still need to fight to make sure that people are put before profit so long as we live under a capitalist system. When it comes to support for disabled people, it's a particularly hard struggle in that support for disabled people does not flow from capitalism. It's in the interest of capital to invest to an extent in what is known as the social wage in education, health care, pensions for workers. But support for working age disabled people who may never be as productive as the average worker is only of interest insofar as it prevents discontent among workers. As Chris Harmon wrote, the capitalist wants contented workers to exploit in the same way as the farmer wants contented cows. Funding for support for disabled people is an expense that capital would love to be rid of and will always do its utmost to minimise. In the current economic situation, the rate of profit hasn't returned to what it was before the financial crash. That means there's still a squeeze on workers' wages and conditions. The World Bank considers the direction of travel for the modern day workplace to be one of ever greater insecurity, lower wages and reduced burdens on employers. None of that is good for the working class. Job insecurity and growing inequality are linked to rocketing levels of mental distress. Worsening conditions for workers are also directly linked to more punitive approaches to out-of-work benefits. It's a well-established principle of welfare provision that conditions must remain better for those in waged labour than for those who haven't contributed to the labour market. We can see this in the way that as insecure work and zero-hours contracts have grown and wages have failed to keep up with the costs of living under the Tories, so requirements placed on benefit claimants have become increasingly unbearable to the extent that experience of the current benefit system has been shown to cause permanent mental distress. But we shouldn't forget that disabled people were also left out of the original welfare settlement. Payments for those with industrial or war injuries were the only benefits specifically aimed at disabled people. It was feared that other payments would undermine the employment incentive and betray the contributory principle of national insurance. Beveridge, whose work provided the basis for the welfare state, was a keen eugenicist who argued that those with general defects should be denied not only the vote but also civil freedom and fatherhood. Progress has been made towards improving attitudes towards disabled people. There'd be an outcry today if a politician voiced the same views as Beveridge, for example. But the economic relationship between disability and capitalism, that's unchanged. If anything, disabled people present more of a threat than ever as our numbers are rising at the same time as workers become more disabling and hostile to those with impairments and health conditions. That means more people trying to claim disability benefits than ever before. Tory plans to slash the disability living allowance budget by replacing it with personal independence payment have failed despite all their cruel attempts to limit eligibility and all that they've made the lives of claimants a living hell. Instead, spending's gone up, and the Office for Budgetary Responsibility actually estimated at the start of this year it would have been cheaper just to have kept DLA. Research suggests that many disabled people who are out of work now would have actually been work, in work in the 1970s. So these underlying economic realities aren't going to change just by getting rid of the Tories. That's something we need to keep in mind as proposals are considered for alternative visions for the future of Social Security. One idea that's been mentioned a few times today already is about universal basic income. That's something the World Bank, and as Mark said, big business support, with many of the tech entrepreneurs behind it, they see it as a way of facilitating even greater job insecurity for the future. A recent report by Guy Standing admits that as a consequence of introducing a UBI, some employers would be encouraged to lower wages. 
as Paula said, a basic income wouldn't cover the extra unavoidable costs of disability, and many supporters in favour of introducing a UBI in Britain have now said that it, wouldn't, it couldn't replace disability benefits, which potentially leads to a situation where there's even greater financial pressure to reduce spending on disability benefits in order to finance a UBI alongside them. And that's a situation where disabled people are possibly left even worse off than we are now. The only way to guarantee a future where disabled people are free from oppression is going to be to get rid of capitalism altogether and to achieve a fundamental social and economic transformation of society. Under capitalism, the exclusion and marginalisation of disabled people has become so embedded within social consciousness as to seem like common sense. It's however, inevitable. it's, however, neither natural nor inevitable within human society, as studies of different cultures and historical periods show, for disabled people to be treated in this way. Society can be organised differently, according to structures that promote collectivism and cooperation, as opposed to rampant individualism. Marx talked about a society organised on the principle of from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. There's no quick and easy fix, no magic bullet, but let's fight together to win a society running the interests of the many, not the few, where everyone is free to develop their personal potential and be valued for the people we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Okay, in terms of that fight back, as our speaker just mentioned, the, the key thing we've got to say is we've got to campaign against universal credit and benefit sanctions. That's the key issue at the moment. Where are the posters? Like, we can't put pressure on the Labour Party to, to change the position on universal credit if we're not arguing vociferously that universal credit has to be scrapped and all benefit sanctions are stopped now. Um, Amber Rudd, in May, announced mighty white of that three-year benefit sanctions would stop at the end of the, the, the year, which is, yes, yes, basically, that's quite nice, should we stop issuing three-year death sentences? Mm -hmm. You've asked the question, why are they doing this? They're, they're, they're trying to escape the, the backlash from ten years of, of the killing spree against the poor, the sick and disabled. The people sleeping in the street, there's not a sudden rise in, in the fad for urban camping. It's the millions of sanctions that force people onto the streets because they can't afford, after they get sanctioned, that, that's the only place for them to, to go. <coughs> um, we need to, and on the same day, um, the Labour Party produced statistics that there's been 32,500 benefit sanctions since 2012, which is 32,500 death sentences. We should is, which is outrageous. The thing, you know, there was a report that came out recently, 130,000 excess deaths due to health cuts. There's the people driven to the deaths through the work capability assessments. The thing with those issues is, for them, the Tories have got plausible deniability. Oh, we didn't know that deaths were going to happen. You know, it's unfortunate, it's a shame, blah, blah. With a three-year sanction, it, it, it's, there can be no other intent but to kill. It's premeditated, cold-blooded murder. We should begin to know what's happened to those two, 32 and a half thousand, thousand people. They've got away with this assault on the points of society by blaming the, the law orders as the as the parasites. It's the bankers and the, and the people at the top of the parasites. We need to put the anger against them and stop Scrap universal credit now and stop all benefit sanctions straight away and have the posters displayed. Thank you. And then LB, you after that? Which one? Just say sorry. In uh, the grey card. Okay. I just say sorry. Um, uh, you'll, you'll have, I have to be quite strict with just two minutes on contributions and I will start tapping when I have to have you sum up. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for this meeting and for the work that um, uh, the activists in DPAC um, are doing to uh, support those of us that are facing the, the rock face of these attacks. Um, last year, I, my PIP was reduced. 
um, the excuses they gave. You, you, if you don't know the madness, you know, the absolute, uh, it is an attack. It's an ideological attack and it is totally intentional. Um, I, Ian Duncan Smith said right at the beginning of what they call welfare reform, we are going to introduce an element of fear into the system. It was absolutely intentional. Um, academics that came onto the BBC to condemn the changes as uh, vicious were uh, it alerted BBC management, the government told the BBC we're not going to have anyone criticising austerity on the BBC anymore and there was, you could, there was a sudden change, you didn't have any critics anymore. Um, last year when I had my benefits cut, it was to, I was told it was because I had maintained eye contact with the assessor <laughs> and that I had made uh, hand gesticulations which showed that I could probably cut carrots up. Um, you know, I, I was using my hands in such a way that belied my claim that I was finding it difficult to prepare meals. So that, that's the, you know, the viciousness of it. My MP, Harriet Harman, when our ME group in South London heard that the de that, uh, disability living allowance was going to be cut and reformed and changed, we wrote to Harriet Harman, uh, begging her to oppose that. She said, no, it needs to be modernised. And publicly, of course, uh, she said, um, Labour is not trusted on benefits. That's why we supported uh, welfare reform. We need socialists in Labour to absolutely hold uh, the Labour Party to account on its backing for welfare reform, to say sorry and to ch and publicly change direction um, and to do all the things that Deepak is asking. Um, and just to say, you know, the 1970s, yes, we did have a high point. We had beverage and we had the 1970s. But, you know, welfare <coughs> and benefits, they're the... This is how they control workers. It's to make it terrifying uh, for you to lose your job. And so you will do whatever you are told. You will obey every single rule so that you don't fall into the workhouse and you don't fall into universal credit because it's ter so terrifying. Um, in the 1970s, just to say, you know, absolutely, yes, it was the high point. There's also the year, the, uh, the decade in which uh, Jim Allen wrote mm -hmm. the, the TV play Scroungers, mm -hmm. in which a young uh, single mother was deprived of benefits because she wasn't a good enough person. And that it's that kind of moral... Uh, moral climate that, that we are having to face. Sorry, I've gone over time, I'll shut up. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I've come down to save a bit of time and to save a bit more time. I'll, I won't make the speech I might have done if I had a bit more. I just a few factual um, observations. For, uh, I'm a member of Equity. Now, there may be people in this room who still believe that equity is a hundred posh white blokes and Judy Dench. <laughs> that is not the case. 50,000 workers and students um, striving to earn a living, mainly on the gig economy, on minimum income level. Uh, in our backward little union, I proposed and thought all oh, hell was going to break loose when I brought through my branch uh, a motion to stop and scrap universal credit, to work with the PCS, bearing in mind the scapegoating that has been prevalent among people who should know better, uh, and working with, the, with various trade unions and affiliating to DPAC. Dramatic pause. The motion was carried unanimously at the, uh, at the equity conference um, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, not only have we taken the position to stop and scrap universal credit, we are looking to work with other campaigns and trades unions. And while I'm not in, the, I'm not one who brags, but I'm going to. And I think for campaigners within the Labour Party, within trades unions. This is the way to seek to work with others and to affiliate to DPAC and those organisations that are leading the struggle. Yeah, hi. Um, if the fight against uh, the attacks on disabled people and the fight to defend social security is 
taught us anything is how ruthless and determined government can be. Um, whatever we throw at it, it, it just ignores it and continues its attacks on us unabated. It's, it's, uh, but it's also shown us that we, as disabled people, we recognised from early on that we were never going to defeat this government on this issue all alone. And that the only way we were going to succeed and move forward was through unity. We also recognised that the government would do everything it possibly could to divide us amongst uh, other groups. And so, it's, uh, you know, Deepak's got a, every reason to be extremely proud of, uh, of its refusal to uh, be set, you know, find itself in opposition to job centre workers who could be seen as being the ones who are delivering the cuts, against social workers who could be seen to be the ones cutting care package, against teachers who can seen to be the ones about producing educational resources for our children, our disabled children. And it's that kind of unity that we need, 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 need to carry on. But we also know that the, the fight to defend social security can't be separated from other struggles, in particular the attacks on the rest of the welfare state, in particular the continued movement of the government to privatise our national health service. And to do that, of course, what has been scapegoating disabled people in relation to social security, is scapegoating mess refugees and, and, and migrants in relation to the attacks on the welfare, on, 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 on the NHS, saying that it's uh, you know, immigrants who are to blame for tour, immigration tourism and the attacks on the NHS. And Marxism 2019 is very much about showing how socialists can, can not just explain how we need to unite all of these struggles together. Uh, the fight against the far right, the fight because the fight against the far right is something that disabled people have been at the heart of with its support to stand up to racism. Because we recognise that if the far right gains a foothold, gains, gains credibility in this country, then it's a disaster for our fight to retain social security and everything else about a free environment and the, and the world that we want to continue to live in. So socialism is at the heart of how we need to examine this, not just to explain how those things are, are connected, but also how to unite those struggles uh, and together and to, in, in action, bring people together to fight back on all of those fronts so that we can fight not just for a, a temporary victory in relation to hope, you know, pushing back the attacks on, on, on social security and the welfare state, but to fight for a system which can actually eradicate the need for a social, social security system and a welfare state and the push for a better world. Okay. Um... I know people are, uh, haven't got much time, so I'll try and make this quick. I want to reiterate the points about the link with work. And if we're going to uh, transform uh, uh, the social security system, I think we have to absolutely break the idea that this is linked uh, uh, to whether you work. Uh, seven years ago, I was on the, on the dole after the economic crisis. I was sent on something called the Work Programme. It was horrific. It was bad for my mental health. Uh, and I ended up feeling like I had to take uh, a job that had a two-hour commute not great wages and all this, because if I didn't take it, I would have lost my benefits. Uh, recently, my hours were cut at work uh, because of the system of universal credit. Uh, I wasn't able to claim uh, like I would have been able to under job seekers allowance uh, because of my partner's earnings. Uh, I found myself having to take on extra casual work to make ends meet. That link uh, 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 between what we get in terms of a welfare state, social security and work is, is, is absolutely pernicious and we have to, have to break it. Um, but we also, we have to resist. Uh, I'm proud that uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, with some of the other Deepak activists in this room, uh, we visited Caxton House with a bunch of these, the Metro, that they paid hundreds of thousands of pounds of our money uh, to tell you how great universal credit is. Uh, it's full of lies. Uh, if this campaign comes back, see one of these, put it in the bin. But for now, they seem to have given up. There's a little video of what we did online. If people want to see it, go to bit.ly slash dump metro uh, and you can see what we got up to and I think we need to get up to more of that. It's right that we can't wait, uh, we have to resist. It's brilliant that more and more unions are coming round to the position of stop and scrap. I think the fact that the DWP and Amber Rudd are spending our money on this stuff is a sign of weakness. We've got them on the run over universal credit and we need to make them run even further. Uh, I, I think actually we should start talking amongst ourselves, the unions that have backed the position, DPAC, uh, uh, people across the movement, we should start talking about can we mobilise a national demonstration against universal credit to give them a kick in, because I know I would love to march alongside Marx members uh, that are being forced to put through this disgraceful policy that will hit them as well. We should be on the streets together against them, making sure that whether it's punk, whether 
brings that high wire pound Boris Johnson into the Tory party, that they stay on the back foot, that we get them on the run, and that we make it absolutely clear that uh, uh, whoever comes next, we aren't having the right to universal credit. Uh, I also think, it's right that UBI was mentioned, we shouldn't have that either, because I think it does make concessions uh, uh, to, 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 to the idea of like, what, were, what capitalism wants, what, what they want. I think it would be absurd if we replace this system we've got now with a universal basic income. Uh, we're, we're one of the nations with the lowest uh, rates of corporation tax in Western Europe. The idea that we would then give a massive wage subsidy uh, to the likes of Tesco's and other massive employers, uh, uh, rather than boosting the, uh, 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 the, uh, the support for those who need it most, is, is absolutely absurd. Uh, so yeah, if I could first call back Paula to make a quick contribution about three minutes. I think, you know, it's of vital importance, you know, uh, universal credit is now where the campaign is at. And to the gentleman in the yellow shirt, there are stop and scrap universal credit campaigns all over the country. We have banners, we have stickers, we've got badges. There's nothing to stop anyone designing their own stop and scrap posters and everything and get involved in the campaign. That's what grassroots activism is all about. Set up a local group and get involved and do something. It's not just down to us, it's down to all of you to get involved in that. You know, That's the most important point. Look, it's important that we support... Right, the library campaigns are an integral part of universal credit. Now, a third of disabled people in the UK have no access to a computer at home and do not know how to use one, and are going to the libraries to fill out the online application for universal credit. And our libraries, since 2011, there's been 32,791 computers lost in the libraries. 891 libraries have been closed since 2010, right? The library workers are under horrendous pressure to help with universal credit applications because welfare rights advice is gone, COBs have gone. The library campaigns are of vital importance. They are the vital lifeline of our communities, the libraries. And without it, you know, a lot of people will be denied access to justice, to social care, to, um, you know, the benefit system. And I've got to pay tribute yet again to our brothers and sisters in Bromley Unite, you know. They've been campaigning for three years to save our libraries because Greenwich Leisure Limited want to turn them into gyms, right? If you can donate anything to the strike fund and the buckets in front of you, I hate asking people for money when everyone's going through a hard time. But if they don't have vital donations, the library campaign will crash and Greenwich Leisure Limited will win. And I'm sure none of you want to see Greenwich Leisure Limited win. They are about profit, not people. They're about increasing the prices of their gyms. They're not interested in libraries at all, okay? But we need that independent inquiry into benefit deaths. We need your support to sign that petition. We need you out there on the 1st of August against for universal credit. We need you to have street stalls wherever you can, speak to people affected, offer support, collect the testimonies of people affected. That's what we've been doing week in, week out. We've been on the picket line week in, week out. It's only by fighting together, united together, is how we're going to win and get the Tories out because the ultimate aim is to get them out so then we can build the social security system that we so need. Thanks for having me all speak to you all today. Thanks. I, just, just to let you know, um, I have um, written to the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission uh, asking them to undertake an investigation. So in addition to signing up to Jodie's petition, um, although a petition won't necessarily lead to an investigation, you could try emailing the Equality and Human Rights Commission and, and saying your support of the investigation and providing any evidence that you have to them. Um, I think that's, that's an important um, push. I think probably uh, there's so much that I agree with everything that has, has, has been said, but I particularly wanted to pick up on the points around... Uh, the issues that we're experiencing under Social Security are exactly the same as, as, as the issues that we're experiencing under the, uh, the NHS and, and, and so on, and particularly the point that was raised about the scapegoating of different groups of people. I mean, that is absolutely what this government, unfortunately, has, has been all, all about. Um, and it's, 
I, I regret that um, until recently, I, I think we were too mild in, in, in terms of countering that. When I, I'm, I'm disappointed that, you know, if, if, if Harriet did write, write that, you know, we have to create arguments to ensure that people um, understand what we're trying to, to do here. Not just, it can't, we can't just be talking to ourselves. We have to be getting out there to talk to others and, and like Ellen is, is, is doing, so we can bring people along with us. I think there is hope. I think there are more people, as I say, I, I know what Mark said, that you know, people have been subjected to the mainstream media and, and everything that, um, that they have tried to, to, to throw at us. But, but the um, British Social Attitude Survey showed things are moving, and we need to keep on pushing on that and saying why. Um, because it can happen to anyone, and we need to make sure that, like the NHS, our social security system is there for everyone, giving us dignity and support when we all need it. So just, um, j just, just briefly, um, I, I, and I know in meetings like this, th th there's never enough time, and I'm sure there would have been some other fantastic contributions. I mean, all, all I wanted to say is, is that um, the best thing about doing meetings like this is that you learn all the time. And, uh, you know, I talked a lot about the members that we have in job centres, and, and I wouldn't want anyone to confuse that with that is tough, but it is nothing like as tough as people who have life conditions that should rely on the state, who get turned away either when the telephone call is inadequate or they don't get very good service. And in a sense, there is something that unites all of this, because under austerity and under vicious governments, this is one government department. I, I can tell you that uh, as the union that represents civil servants, the job that our people in the Home Office are being asked to do is demoralising. The job in tax offices when they are not enforcing national minimum wage legislation and they are not chasing down tax <coughs> dodgers is demoralising. It's demoralising for our teachers who see kids come in who do not eat over the weekends. Is demoralizing for our frontline council staff. So ultimately, what I think we're all recognizing here is that only through a united joining up of all of these struggles, both in the immediate and in the long term, to ditch this government, for one, and get a radical government that's going to tackle it, must be something we all commit to. But no one should ever read into that, that anybody argues, until you get a general election, everybody trundles along. So I agree with the comrade in the yellow that there are some immediate things that we need to be on the front foot over. Sanctions and capability tests and universal credit are, are the obvious ones. And we, I think it's a great idea if we can get to a situation where we have a march, for example, is about these issues. Believe you me, that PCS for years has struggled to get hardly any other union to be prepared to talk at the TUC conference about issues of social security. I can, I can tell you that, it, it saddens my heart, but you talk to the people we work with, not just in Deepak, but the unemployed workers centers, um, and it is now switching, I do agree. This is changing because universal credit and seeing disabled people take direct action because people are dying is a game changer. It's affected the Labour Party because the policy that they are currently going around the country of is whether it's good enough yet in universal credit, I take the point, but it is actually consulting on a, quote, radical change in social security, not just sticking plasters, which we have to ensure that we enact with. So what I really wanted to, to sort of finish with is this, that nobody should take into anything I said as being doom and gloom. I mean, I'm one of life's eternal optimists, and no matter how hard it is in the uh, DWP, I tell you, the DWP want to make a propaganda video about universal credit. They didn't get a single PCS member in the DWP <laughs> Liverpool who was prepared to, to participate. Now that's a start. We've had a strike in the Midlands of universal credit staff. Now that strike is because their working conditions, they're understaffed, it is demoralizing. They've gone on strike and there will be other strikes in universal credit offices that we need to unite around. So ultimately, at this weekend, whether it's people dying who could be saved in our health service because of underfunding, people dying because we don't have an adequate social security system, people who are suffering, we have got to unite people to mobilize stronger unions, more strikes, more direct action, and actually get on the front foot. And I'll leave you with this controversial thing to say at the last, but I'm gonna say it, is that means that we cannot ignore the fact that some of these issues do not get the hearing we want because we have been obsessed with Brexit, wherever you stand, and the government's getting away with blue murder, 
where we all spend every waking minute. And I just want to just say this point, right? Well, whatever happens there, at the end of the day, whether you are in or whether you're out of the European Union, these things must be confronted now. And we've got to get across in our working class communities, that while everyone's talking about this, that, and the other, it is our families, our brothers and sisters and friends who are suffering under this government. And in a way, the social security system a country has defines how humane it is. And if you define ours by a social security system, we are right at the bottom of the Humanity League. There are so many really terrible things that have been happening since 2010. Before that as well, but I think the things that many of us here have seen since 2010, we didn't probably believe we would in our lives. And whether that's people being denied the benefits they need to live on, or the abuses and the injustices that carry on happening in the assessment and treatment units. It's shocking and it's emotive and it's upsetting. But it's so important that we don't let ourselves be divided that we unite together and we fight for a better society. We need to fight in the here and now for social security system that enables us all to live with dignity and for support, for social care support. But really, the kind of society that we want, the kind of world we want, where we can all be included and supported to live a full life, that's not something that can be achieved through modifications or compromises with capital. What we need is a revolution. So join the Socialist Workers' Party, help us fight the reforms we need now, and the revolution that can free us from a society that throws us on the scrap heap. Thank you. Thank you.